to the net by Kylian Mbappe. Oh, Benyera, beautifully done. Corne finds Dembele. The first touch is good. The second is deadly. Neymar still. Oh, my word, what a goal. Golovin, lovely finish. Oh, yes, delivery. Gendouzi's header. Here's an opportunity, Sanchez. Outrageous goal from Gael Kakuta. Play it again. A goal back. Welcome along to this week's Le Bourge, the official Ligue 1 podcast in English. Coming up, well, nothing much really this week, to be honest. Only a thriller between third and second that becomes second against third, as Lens make off with the goods versus Marseille. A nine-goal spectacular in Lyon that sees gunslingers Lacazette and Wahi slug it out. And PSG only go and suspend the greatest footballer of all time and then move a step closer to the title. So, not a lot really. There's Deja Who, of course. So, unlike those Lyon fans cursing themselves today, don't leave early. My name's Ian Holyman. I'm joined by Andreas Evagora and Jonathan Johnson. Looking forward to hearing their thoughts on a thrilling weekend and potentially decisive weekend of Ligue 1 Uber Eats action. There's one place to start, surely. That's at the Stade Félix Bollard de Lely on Saturday night as Lens, in third place, took on Marseille in second. Armel Tongi saw this one. In recent games, pretty much all of Marseille's attacks have finished in shots. There might be one here. Alexis Sanchez scores! It's a huge mistake at the back that allows Marseille to take the lead inside eight minutes. The goal has been ruled out for a foul committed by Alexis Sanchez on Kevin Danso. Machado hangs one up for Sotica to attack at the back post. It'll come for Openda. Danso leaves it for Fofana. And if the first one hit the post, that one didn't. An absolute rocket from Seco Fofana. Lifts the roof off the Stade Bollard. Loss in front in this crunch game. What a goal. What a goal. Machado's delivery. A cut back from Openda to Danzo wasn't the best, but that allowed Fofana to run onto this ball. And how about that for a finish? He loves that sort of opportunity from outside the box. Seco Fofana. The curl on it. The power on it, both more than enough to beat Paul Lopez, his fifth of the season, perhaps the most important. Oh, brilliant interchange between Frankowski and Sotica. The cross to the back post, it's two, of course, it's Lois Appender, it always is. And Los have breathing room. Oh, the noise inside Bollard is absolutely deafening. And 19th of the season. For that man, Lois Sapenda, look how hyped up he is. How about this interchange between Frankowski and Florian Sotica? Simple from a throw-in, but so effective. And what a ball it was from Przemyslav Frankowski. Openda on his toes, reading the flight of the ball and nodding it perfectly back across the flight of Paul Lopez's dive. Marseille. With a mountain to climb, it's last two, OM nil. As Genduzi strides forward into the path of Valentin Rangier. Might come for Dimitri Payet. Still, Dimitri Payet makes it 2-1. Two and a half minutes remain. Marseille on the scoreboard. Thanks to their captain, their number 10, Dimitri Payet. Might this game not quite be done yet. 36 years of age, Dimitri Payet. The man to finally make the breakthrough for Marseille. Just his third goal of the season. Gentlemen, a game that really lived up to its billing. I even thought that it was worth watching before the game. It, it certainly turned out to be the case. Um, interestingly, Seko Fofana said Marseille deserved to win, while Paul Lopez, the Marseille goalkeeper, said Lost deserved to win. Um, JJ, who deserved to win? Good question. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was as full-blooded, I think, as we we hoped it would be, <clears throat> you know, really fast start. Marseille getting the goal chalked off inside of the first 10 minutes, uh, you know, but ultimately I do feel like Lance probably did shade it for me. Uh, and I, to be honest, I expected that to be the case before that. I mean, it was such a momentous occasion for them. 
uh you know to see the crowd as well you know building up that kind of atmosphere for such a big game i mean we, they've been doing it all season obviously but uh you know for a match with that much on the line i think uh you know it was it seemed like a really really special moment for for lance and in this incredible season that they're having so for me i would put lance slightly ahead of marseille in terms of who deserved to win it and i thought seco fofana individually was fantastic obviously he had that effort from range that crashed off the woodwork before he actually got the goal which was a, a fine finish as well but uh you know i think it was a huge game for for lance coming into it, a huge opportunity and they they took it and i think marseille will feel really disappointed especially sort of given over the last couple of months their form on the road has actually generally been better than their home form as well it, it certainly has they've been on they've been unbeaten in 11 before going before going north it was though the the best home team in Lens against the best away team and as you mentioned Lens just slightly ahead of, of Marseille in the game they're now slightly ahead of Marseille in the table as well Lens up to second place two points clear of Marseille who are now in third but Andreas, I mean, JJ mentioned it early on. Um, the goal that wasn't for Alexis Sanchez. Now, Alexis Sanchez is anything but a physical kind of guy. Okay, he's he's tenacious, but he, he committed <laughs> allegedly, supposedly, actually a foul on Kevin Danso. And if you if you compare those two guys, I I, I don't think th there was no for me that wasn't a foul. It just, it just wasn't a foul. I, I agree with you, and I'm going to stand up for people who are a little bit vertically challenged. I mean, I'm taller than Alexis Sanchez, but that's not saying much. But I, I did check, it's funny you mentioned that, Ian, the, the height difference uh, is 22 centimetres um, between those two players. Uh, you know, Kevin Danso's a unit. He can look after himself, and it was, the, it was a slight little push, but I, I agree with you, and it was a nice finish as well. I think uh, Sanchez was uh, a little bit unlucky. Uh, that really might have changed things, obviously, an early goal, because Marseille started really well, didn't they? I thought the first 20 minutes, I was thinking, hmm, that, that they might have this, although I, I did think that Lons would win it before the match. Yeah, this this was a really good game, a uh, good tactical game, uh, just the right amount of spice. You know, there was a moment where one of the Lons players kicked the ball into the uh, Marseille dugout, and a few players came out, and the play, you know, the game had to be calmed down a bit. But it didn't, you know, it never, it, it never went over the top, but there was just that not, nice amount of... Uh, aggression and, and, and competition there. Another few talking points. Um, I thought Appenda, Marcel would be disappointed that they conceded that header because Frankowski got around the back of uh, Tavares. And, you know, Tavares is another big guy and he, he really shouldn't have been beaten so easily uh, to allow Appenda to get that header. Um, I agree, uh, Fafana was outstanding. You know, uh, he hit the post, didn't he, just before uh, scoring that goal with a, a similar kind of effort. Uh, Bree Samba made some very good saves. It could have gone either way. I thought I thought Lons just about deserved it. To answer your question, I mean the match analyst uh, for French television, Habib Bay, he asked that question immediately. He said, Look, "Did the best team win?" But he said the most realistic team won. The French like to use that word, didn't they? Don't they? The the, the, the keep realist. In other words, the team that just took their chances. Um, and that was Lons, and they're second, and they're certainly in, in, in pole position now to, to finish in that position. I'm glad that Andres jumped in as well with uh, that Bruce Samba save, because if I remember correctly, it's really like low down into the bottom corner, and that felt like a, a, a really crucial part of the game. I mean, going back to the, the Sanchez on Danso thing, I mean, I'm not a, a Bundesliga expert in the way that some of us here had, had been over the years, but if I recall correctly, Danso kind of always had those kind of hiccups in his game, which I think is something that we've known him to have as well from time to time with Lance. Uh, you know, so I do think that, you know, the hosts got off quite lightly there. But equally, uh, you know, I'm glad that Andreas mentioned Tavares as well. This this is kind of Tavares' season in a nutshell. We know how brilliant he can be going forward and the goals that he's chipped in for OM over the course of the season. But defensively, he's always been a bit of a liability. And I know this isn't Appenda's first headed goal of the season because he's cropped up with a couple of them recently. But this illustrates exactly why Marseille have really struggled to... Uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, accommodate Tavares uh, in the best way possible, because there's always been these question marks over his defensive ability. And OK, you know, we can't maybe put the entire result on his shoulders, but equally, uh, you know, you've got to be getting tighter to your man, especially somebody who's on fire in the way that Appenda has been recently. 
So, you know, to see him sort of crop up with the match winner wasn't surprising at all. Uh, and I do think that Marseille feel that this, you know, was an opportunity missed because they did have the chances at the end of the day to at least draw that game, which at this stage of the season could have been enough to to consolidate second place. I have to say for the second Lord's goal, that was a lovely bit of play between uh, Sotoka and, and Frankowski down that, down that, down that right hand side just 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 check it out a couple of little volley touches it was it was it was really a beautiful little build up to 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 that goal the the real question now of course is is guys that who finishes second obviously Lance in the box seat and here's the run-ins okay Lance they've got Reims Lorient Ajaccio Auxerre Marseille Angers already relegated Lille Brest Ajaccio Pick the bones out. Pick the bones out of that one. I, th- I think that it's pretty difficult to say. I I, th- I think um, yeah. I, I think it's slightly easier for for Lons that you were saying the, the last game is at Orsera, right? But that, that's important. If if Lons are, if Orsera's safe, I think Lons have got a, an easier run in there. Obviously, you never really want to play a team whose whose future is on the line on the last day. Uh, Lille, you know, Lille could be really tough for Marseille on on a on a good day. Lille are very good, so. I, I think Lille Lons have got a slightly easier run in. A lot of it is, you know, holding your nerve and having experience at that level, which maybe might go in Marseille's way slightly. But I remember last time I was on the pod a month or so ago, I, I thought Lons were going to come second and I'll, I'll stick with that. Yeah, I'd agree with Andreas. Uh, I do think that Lille will probably be the, the toughest uh, opponent for Marseille in that run in uh, and probably the decisive one as well, because it feels like it's a question of who slips up somewhere. And it's difficult to see Lens, uh, you know, tripping up with those games that they have left. Although, you know, Reims perhaps not the easiest team to to come up against now that they're back in a bit of form under Will still. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys you guys mentioned that uh, Lille is probably the one, the banana skin where where Marseille will will slip up because um, Reims played Lille at the weekend and Reims won, and they'll then lost his next opponents, Marshall Munetzi, getting getting the only goal, Reims. After going winless in in four and uh, probably no chance at all of of still out at the uh, Stade August alone anyway, but um, Reims getting back to to winning ways. Lille though missing an, an opportunity. Um, Monaco not. Uh, you'll hear more about that a, a little bit later. Remy Cabella. I don't know if you saw this, guys. H- how has he not scored? It reminded it reminded me a little bit of the the moment where Eric Maxime. Chupa Moteng uh, did a brilliant goal line clearance for somebody. I can't remember who, but while he was a PSG player. It was Salzburg, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> did you see the XG on that? The XG was like 98 or something. And the, unfortunately, the, that, the, the, there was a comparison with that Chupa Moteng miss. Um, yeah, that's that's not one. It's a shame because he's had a good season, isn't yeah, he? Was, he I, it, it, just basically, I can't even describe it. I can't even describe. He's about he's about two yards out, and somehow the ball, and somehow the ball doesn't go in. That's about as the only way that I can describe it. It, it, it gets cleared. Uh, to, to be fair, there were a few questionable misses in that game, though, because I remember Balogun in the build up to the goal hits the bar from about three yards yeah, out. See, as I, well. Maybe he, maybe the, he just did it deliberately so Manetsky Manetsky could get the the goal. But another another goal for Manetsky, <laughs> and uh, again, I think I've mentioned on the pod before. I think he's had a superb season. He is. Uh, He's one to watch um, in this. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry for the mis- the, the the slight mispronunciation of uh, of, of Monetsky. Do you know why? It's because I was moving on to Monaco already, where Alexander Golovin, Alexander Golovin got uh, got got a big goal um, against Angers away. Monaco. Wow, this is this is a big move. This is a big power move from from Philippe Clement. Wissam Ben Yedda suspended by the club at Monaco, following in the footsteps of PSG. More of that later as well. Uh, to to suspend their their team captain, Ben Yedda arriving late for the tactical team talk on Saturday. Um, no Kevin Folland. He was he he was gone too. Uh, he, at least on on the bench at, at kickoff. Monaco getting the win at the Stade Raymond Copper. More Myron Boadu on the score sheet as well. The young man who signed from AZ Altma with a lot of fanfare in the summer of 2021. Only t- turned 22 in January. Maybe more to come from him and uh, potentially with Ben Yedda moving out. 
do we see Boadu moving in? So we talked about Lille, miss, Lille slipping up. Monaco there taking advantage, only just, it has to be said, against Angers. But Rennes also uh, taking a slip, which was good news uh, for Lille. Also, I suppose, good news for Monaco as well. It was also good news for Lyon, which we'll, uh, which we'll talk about as well in a moment. Rennes failing to capitalise then. They're three points adrift of Lille, who remain in fifth. Ren in sixth. Yes, this was the Amin Guiri Ikiko. I can't even get that. And the Gaetan Labordico as well. Uh, having those two having swapped swapped sides in the summer. Laborde getting the better of it on the score sheet as well. Uh, lovely ball in by Badreddin Buonani. Now, if you don't know anything about this kid, guys, you're gonna know a lot about him. He looks a superb player. Um, one of one of the the sort of niece. Youth Academy graduates. He's come through into the first team. And uh, I can see JJ nodding his head uh, vigorously, uh, clearly in, in support of this. You've been impressed by Buonani this season, JJ? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and I think it's really coming to a crucial moment now for Nice because despite the victory, they still look uh, like a long shot to qualify for Europe. And given the amount of talent that they have in that squad, you'd expect that there's going to be a lot of European clubs coming knocking uh, you know, trying to prize some of these talents away. And I would rank sort of Buonani as one of the players that Nice really cannot afford to to lose this summer, the kind of player that they probably want to rebuild around. I mean, we could have a debate, uh, I guess, about the likes of Kefren Turam, uh, you know, and whether he stays on, uh, you know, Todibo as well. But I think Buonani is one of the guys that Nice, especially at this stage of his career where he's still developing and looks like such uh, a fantastic talent, even in these early stages, uh, you know, they really cannot afford to to let him go. And it's it's a shame how Nice's form declined a bit in recent weeks, especially around sort of the, the Europa Conference League ties, because it really felt like under Degas, they they really had a chance of, uh, you know, making a real fist of it to, to qualify for Europe. Don't want to write them out prematurely. It does feel like a long shot at this stage. Yeah, that was their first home win since the 10th of February. But just to come back to, to Bunani, 18 years old from from Lille, a fourth assist for him. Um, yeah, very, very, very talented player in, indeed. Ren, though, uh, lost as many games in Ligue 1 in 2023. That's nine in 18, as they did in the whole of 2020, 20, of 2022. Uh, another big mistake from Arthur Teat as well in that one, to allow in Terra Moffi, who's uh, been in excellent form, only Victor Ossimen and uh, Mo Salah. Of course, with more goals since Moffi made his Ligue 1 debut. 39 now since 2020, 2021 season. 34 with Lorient, 5 now with Nice. I think that was a very, very good bit of business by Nice, actually, to bring him in in January. Well, it's mostly been a season of mediocrity at the Group Armour Stadium, where Lyon fans turned up in their tens as a, a fairly sparse crowd watched them play host to Montpellier, on Sunday, Angus Tarose. Uh, no wonder he's not on the podcast this morning because he saw this one. Shirky, good ball in. Barkala, look has it. Half an hour exactly gone in the Group Armour Stadium, and it's Leon's top scorer who shoots them in front. Goal number 21 for Alexander Lacazette in his second stint back at his formative club. Oh, off the ball there, Le Penon. It comes Wahi, puts the ball away. And Montpellier have an equaliser from nowhere. And Johan Le Pen on scratches his head as he's caught in possession. And Eli he continues his significantly improved scoring form with Montpellier. He's on the ball again. This time, uh, Dejan Lovren. Le Penon's missed it again. he's still going. Wahi directed and it's in! Two goals in a minute. And Montpellier... Go from 1-0 down to 2-1 in front. Wahi, he's on a hat-trick. He's got Dejan Lovren with him. Goes down and the referee gives a penalty. It goes from bad to worse. This for his hat-trick. And he scores it. And Montpellier have a 3-1 lead. 16th goal of the season. For the man who just seems to not be able to stop scoring of late. Oh, and Thiago Mendes has given it away. It's the second mistake from him. And over the top it goes again. And Eli Wai is through again. Can he make it four? He can! Unbelievable! Leon imploding! 
Montpellier exploding. Diamonde tried to stop it going in and it went through his legs. Ball forward and here is uh, Le Pen. Oh, lovely! Le Cazette from Barkala. And a little bit of hope has been ignited. Lovely ball from Thiago Mendes. Barkala's second assist of the game, getting past Felai Sacco. And a simple tap in for the Leon skipper. 4 2. Thiago Mendes, the referee, is allowing play to come here and it's really making for an entertaining game. And there is the third goal for Leon from Dejan Lovren. And the comeback is on. Astonishing back and forth game. Lovren's first goal of the campaign. Kakare to Shirky. Shirky rides one challenge. Tries to send through another one. Lovely. Barkala read that well. Tried to get to the byline. Barkala through! And there it is! Oh, Alexander Lacazette with the captain's run. Barkala with a third assist of the match. And Leon have gone from being in front to being three goals behind to being level. Sinali Diamande in by Jafinho. Ryan Shirky. Shirky into the middle. A hack away by... Well, yeah, it's over the top by Barkala. Julien on Le Cazette. Tugging of the arm. A yellow card for Michel Dizakar, which probably means it's a penalty. And it is. Oh, can he do it again here? Le Cazette scores. And Leon steal the victory right at the end. Corridor to Liso, who's not playing, celebrates. A smile from the coach. Delirium in the Group Harbour Stadium. Well, the socks were probably off in the in the uh, commentary booth for Angus as he tried to keep <laughs> count of, <laughs> of just what on earth was going on with that one. Um, the, f- the first time a Ligue 1 Uber Eats side has, has clawed back a three-goal deficit since Bordeaux at Monaco in 2008. I ca- sorry, I can't get that visualisation out of my head now. Angus with his... His socks off. Elia Wahi, <laughs> the first Montpellier player to score four goals in a Liga 1 game ever. And he did so in, in 15 minutes. I don't know if that says more. Having watched the goals, I don't know if that says more about Elia Wahi's abilities <laughs> or Leon's uh, inabilities, Andres. It, it was a bit of both. I mean, Wahi for that period was was just unplayable, wasn't he? Um, and, and, and Lovren was really struggling um, at times. Um, it was no, it, it was a masterclass from him, and it was a, a really, really classy display. I, I particularly liked. I think it was the fourth one when the, he he was on a one on one against Lopez, and the ball just rolled in. And even before the ball was over the over the line, he was celebrating and nearly taking off his shirt again because he took his shirt off after getting three. They clearly thought they'd won the game at that stage. The way uh, Montpellier were, were celebrating, I, I guess most people did. Um. And then that amazing comeback. I mean, you know, Lacazette with four as well. Barcola was, again, excellent. I, I commentated the match uh, last week, and Barcola was really very good against Strasbourg. He had a goal ruled out that was, again, really, really very tight on VAR. So a real breakthrough season for him. And in terms of comebacks, I mean, I'm showing my age a bit, but I do I remember, do you remember Marseille were 4-0 down against Montpellier? This is really going back. And almost all of the velodrome left. Um, before a 5-4 comeback. That, that's one I can kind of compare it to. Um, and Leon with that late, late, <clears throat> I think it was a 100th minute um, winner. And yes. I thought it was a penalty. It's another talking point, Ian, because it was, it, it, like I said, it was getting pushed and shoved. And it's the kind of thing we see all the time in football, in all the major leagues in Europe. And it very rarely gets pulled up when you see, I mean, it, it was like a real sort of body hug. And that, to me, that was a clear penalty. Um, and Lacazette keeping his call cool to make it 5-4. An amazing match. And yeah, I mean, Ag- Agus is a very much a stats guy. So he's, he, I, yeah, I, I agree. I can only imagine what he's going through this morning. Is His hard drive must be like bursting at the seams there with all those numbers. But uh, Leon 5-4, well done to them. And they're just about keeping their European hopes alive. I'm surprised they didn't spontaneously combust at full time. There's, there's, here's some more stats for you. The second time in the last 75 years in Ligue 1 that both teams have seen one of their players score at least four times. That was Rance 8, <laughs> eight <laughs> Monaco 4 in May... What? In May 1974. 
Five five goals for Carlo, Carlos Bianchi, four for for Delio Onis, who also now shares why he now shares a place with him as uh, the 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 first to score four goals in a top flight game without winning. Um, Alexandre Lacazette, the the first quadruple of his pro career, um, the the first um, foursome, as it were, for a Lyon player since Bernard Lacombe against Bastia on the 26th of January 1975. And and just to put that into context, both those um, historic matches happened before I was born. That's how long ago that, that this was. I, I Lacazette was, was was very, very good, I thought. And um, he, he does seem to be the perfect foil, the perfect role model, because literally he was the boyhood hero of Bradley Barkala and, and probably of Ryan, Ryan Shirky as well. I thought Shirky played pretty well yesterday, but Barkala, since January, has been absolutely on fire. Three assists for him. And, and JJ was talking about clubs trying to hold on to young players. I mean, Leon, Leon is surely going to have to, they're going to have a lot of offers for Bradley Barkala. I mean, it, he, he's been one that's been talked about, hasn't he, JJ? But I mean, he's really, really coming good on that potential now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's already been, uh, you know, a number of, European giants sort of listed in terms of like potential interest in uh in you know picking him up uh obviously wouldn't come cheap given the talent that he sort of exhibited but I think as well for for Ligue 1, uh you know lovers uh you know over the last couple of decades he also really reminds me of Freddie Piquion uh mm. you know not just in, sort of in terms of his uh his appearance either you know in terms of sort of his ability to get goals at key moments uh and you know I think Again, similar to the discussion that we were having about Buonani a couple of minutes ago, Leon, I mean, okay, they're a bit closer to Europe, so they still have a hope of uh, of qualifying. Whereas for Nice, it's really tempting now to rule them out of it. So I think if Leon do manage to to qualify for Europe, there's still a case for Barkler to stay and to continue his development a little bit more because unlike some of his teammates, he hasn't really had that experience uh, in European competition yet. But equally, you know, he's you know cropped up on the radar so unexpectedly that there is already going to be this gaggle of, you know, massive European clubs looking to try and sign him up. And, you know, Leon also have to try and figure out a way to build for the future without cashing in on all of these young talents, because there are, you know, there's a number of very, very good players in that squad at this moment in time. You know, uh, Lukeba as well in defense is somebody who's going to attract a lot of interest. Uh, you know, Cherky as well. We already know that, you know, PSG were very keen on him, uh, you know, back in January along with a number of other European clubs. So, you know, Lyon, again, some, you know, a club that I expect a number of their players to be sort of highly sought after. But uh, Barkler, in terms of sort of what he's done, I remember seeing him at Parc des Princes up close um, a couple of months ago, and he really is a, a, a pretty special talent. I agree with Jonathan. I think the key word there is is choice, because I don't think Lyon are not going to hang on to all of these players, are they, if we look at the last few years? And which ones are they going to really prioritise? And I, I, Barcoli, when you look at him physically, he, he doesn't look like the player that he is, if you see what I mean. He's kind of tall and rangy, and, but he's actually a, a brilliantly skillful player. He's a good dribbler. He, I, I, I would have him as a pretty much high up as a, as a priority because I think he's still got a long, long way to develop. Um, Cherky's contract was interesting because it was recently um, renewed, but not because of anything that the players... Or, or, or the agents did. There was a clause in his contract that as soon as he played a, a certain number of games, his his contract was was extended. I should say, not renewed. Um, will he go at the end of this? I wouldn't be that surprised if Cherky moves on. I really think they should keep Barcola, and, and they can say, look, you're going to be playing regular football. You're going to be a, a heart of this team, playing up front with Lacazette, um, and that might be the kind of temptation to to keep Barcola at, at Lyon. Yeah, twenty years old, Bradley Bradley Barcola. Um, a brilliant, a brilliant assist, but an orthodox assist for the first one where he, he stretched Zlatan-esque to, to keep the ball in. It was a cross actually from Shirk. He was slightly over hit and Barkala somehow kept it in. It was a fantastic finish as well, I thought, from, from Lacazette. Three, three teaming up for that, for that one. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I think, El Yuwahi as well, channeling his, his inner Nicola Palwa, surprisingly enough, uh, with that strapping on his left leg. Just take a look at Palwa this season. Eluahi doing the same. It's not really helping Palwa's goal scoring uh, ability, but it's it's certainly not doing not doing Wahi 
uh, any 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 problems uh, whatsoever. It'll be interesting to see him at the under twenty one Euro uh, for France this summer. Joris Shotar as well, another young midfielder for for Montpellier. A couple of assists. Um, part of the Zidane family, married to uh, one of the nieces of Zinedine Zidane. That must make for uh, an interesting interesting discussion about midfield play uh, with with the youngster if he's not slightly intimidated. Now, um, a big move off the pitch from Lyon uh, just announced today. Uh, it's a bank holiday in France. It's Victory in Europe Day. Um, you may also describe it if you're if you're a, a, a Lyon owner like uh, John Texter as Victory for for Eagle Day. Um, Jean Michel Olas stepping down after 36 years in charge of Lyon. The background to this: Olas selling his shares in the club to Textor, but was supposed to stay as the president of the club, has done so until today. He's now the, the president, the honorary president, which we all know what that means. That's that's glorified gardening leave and Textor taking over. Regardless of, of, of Textor taking over and what this is going to mean for, for Lyon, this is, a, this is a huge change, not only for Lyon, but in French football, where Jean-Michel Lolas has been one of, if not the dominant figure for oh God, as long as as long as I can remember, uh, uh, as long as I've been in France for the last the last twenty years, and and even more so, hasn't he, Andreas? I think so. I think it's hard to exaggerate just what a, a really a great president he's been. Now he said the odd silly thing over the over the years in defence of of his team, but this guy. I mean, I always go back to we used to work with uh, a guy who was brought up in Lyon in the 70s and 80s, I think you know who I'm talking about, Ian, um, at, when we were working together at Eurosport. Lyon was not a football city in the 70s and 80s. Uh, um, if you like football in Lyon, you would go to Saint-Étienne. They were playing in the second division. Um, and Olas took over the club. Uh, and it, it, just his list of achievements, he, he made Lyon a great team with winning those seven titles from nowhere. Um, we have to talk about the women's football because he was investing in women's football when he was widely mocked. Um, I remember people saying, come on, women's football, what's ever going to become of that? He was right on that. Um, the players that he's brought in back to the men's side, especially the South American network. I mean, he built up this network of South American scouts that brought in so many great players. And and <clears throat> to top it off, and to me, <clears throat> excuse me, born as the Youth Academy, when you look at the players that Leon have produced over the years, he put recently of uh, the great Leon players in the youth academy, but by the year of birth, you know, and he, every every year you take the year that like Benzema was born, there were like four great players coming out of, of the youth academy just from that year. Um, so the guy has, you know, turned Leon into a, a major force. There was always potential. Because Lyon is the third biggest city in in uh, in France. It's quite a prosperous city. It's quite an economic hub. But there was very little football tradition there. I know, of course, people would say the last 10 years, Lyon haven't done too much. But when you look at his career uh, since taking over in the 80s, it, it's a fantastic achievement. Uh, and you have to take your, your hat. So I'd probably say he's the, 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 the greatest um, club president that, that the country has had. Right? It's hard to think of a better one because he really is turned them into a force uh, starting from a very, very low, uh, a very low position. Of course, there's the new stadium as well. So congratulations to Olas. Uh, he's had a great career, but when a new company comes in and, and buys any kind of company, they tend to want to put their own men in or women in. And that's what's happened here. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I interviewed Jean-Michel Olas in the Group Armour Stadium, which was really his baby. He really fought hard uh, for them to, to get that. It is, a, it is a magnificent football arena. Um, I also remember interviewing Bruno Genesio when he was the Lyon coach. Now, Genesio was also a Lyon player at the time that Olas came in. Now, Olas only took over because Bernard Tapie, who's another legendary French football figure who was uh, president at Marseille when they won the, the, the inaugural Champions League in 1993, Tapie had a TV program and um, he invited Olas on and, and he, 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 Tapie obviously had friends and uh, in in the in the in the business and said to Olas, look, you should take over as president and uh, of Leon. And he was like, well, a bit reluctant. And eventually he did so. Genesio said, the guy came in and said, right, 
We're going to be in Ligue 1 next season. Then we're going to be in European competition. We're going to have a TV club channel. And we're talking about the late 80s. There were barely any actual TV channels, never mind club TV channels. And now what have we got? You're talking about one of the most innovative, driven, ambitious, and also intelligent football administrators, not only of French football, I think of, 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 okay, I'll go for European football, probably good go for world football, because he really did turn Lyon into an absolute powerhouse. Seven titles in a row was, was, a, was a tremendous uh, achievement. Uh, have you had any run-ins with him, JJ? I haven't had any run-ins with him personally, but obviously as somebody who's followed, uh, you know, French football, uh, you know, over a number of decades like yourself, it, it's impossible to to speak highly enough of, of Olas and sort of what he's done for, you know, both the game domestically, but also in Europe, because let's not forget there was that time as well where Lyon were, you know, sort of leading the charge for, for France and flying the flag uh, on the continent, uh, you know, and I think they were built up to be, you know, a very much a modern club sort of around the time that, you know, the Qataris arrived in Ligue 1 with PSG. Uh, and, you know, obviously the last couple of years haven't been ideal. Uh, you know, Lyon have sort of been on this kind of steady decline. But equally, everything that Olas has done, you know, over the course of his tenure with Lyon, you know, I think he deserves to be spoken in sort of the same tones as, uh, you know, uh, uh, the likes of a Giroud, somebody who's done so much to, to put a club on the map that, you know, you're their histories are kind of inextricably linked. Uh, you know, and I do think it's quite interesting sort of the timing of this and how it's all come about, because if I'm not mistaken, Olas did mention sort of publicly uh, a few weeks ago that there was an option for Textor to sort of buy him out of that agreement where he'd stay on as president for a couple more years. Obviously, it hasn't worked out as planned so far this season. You know, fingers crossed for Leon that they do make Europe because... It would be a shame to see the the current squad picked apart because at the end of the day, that youth academy is, uh, you know, Olas's legacy. But I don't think that Olas is going to be going quietly. It does sound like he's going to still be very much involved uh, in terms of you know professionalizing the women's game in France. So expect to see a lot of him still, uh, you know, certainly with regards to the French Football Federation. But you know, I think despite the sort of you know checkered recent history for for Lyon in terms of you know what they've done in in domestic competition and in Europe let's not forget they did have that dalliance uh, you know with Champions League success just a couple of years ago coming out of COVID uh, you know where they made it all the way to the semi-finals but you know I think you know you have to look at what Olas's legacy is going to be now at Lyon and he has built up a, a very very impressive operation over the years and uh, you know fingers crossed that you know that doesn't go to waste uh you know under under foreign ownership because not everybody is sort of for the amount of foreign ownership that's come into the french game uh you know but it has sort of become obvious over the last couple of years that leon needed something to, to push them forward to to change the project a little bit perhaps that new impetus uh you know will give them the opportunity to to do so but you know i think olas at this moment in time stepping down you know all people you know who really love French football can really do at this moment is is celebrate him and what he's achieved over the years. Well, as you mentioned, Leon, uh, really you know, a, a club shaped for European football. They currently sit in seventh place in the Ligue 1 table on fifty six points behind Rennes, who were in sixth on goal difference. Lille then in fifth, the first of the automatic qualifying spots. They're on fifty nine points. Monaco on sixty four, and then a six point gap to the top three, Marseille in third on 70, Lens on 72, and a PSG six points clear of them. More on PSG in a little bit. Everybody's played 34 games. That means four games to go till the end of the season. So it's tight at the top. It's getting very much the squeaky bum time at the bottom of the table, particularly for Nantes, damaging 2-0 defeat to, to Strasbourg. I say this every week. Hmm. Maybe I can get Stephen Willis to to do a meme of me um, just saying this. Habib Diallo. Insert insert your word in the middle of that, whatever you like. Habib Diallo, that's 18 for the season for him. On the score sheet again, I'm even getting bored with league and clubs not buying this guy. The big ones say, because the guy just does it again and again and again and again. Not though... In serious free fall, uh, the Frederick Ant Antonetti effect. 
I'm not sure if there's a syndrome there, but he's uh, he's doing he's doing pretty well. Three points now, Strasbourg clear of the bottom four. Brest seeing themselves overtaken by Strasbourg on goal difference. Lorient winning the derby, two goals to one. But Brest, of course, had that big win over Nantes in in midweek. Um, Ibrahim Akone with a couple of goals for Lorient. Auxerre still in trouble, but they're two points clear of the bottom four, thanks to a draw at home to uh, Clermont. It was Isaac Torre who was uh, suspended by uh, Marseille for the game against Marseille last week. He was also actually suspended. He got on the score sheet, the 19-year-old, two metres and six defender. Um, let's see Let's see how he does if he returns to Marseille in the summer. And it's a relegation looming now for Ajaxio. They drew nil-nil at home to Toulouse. They can be confirmed as joining Angers in the second division next weekend. They are 11 points adrift of safety with four to play. Another team in really big trouble is Troyes. Patrick Kisnobo's tenure at the club has not really changed much since he took over from Bruno Ilés Troyes. Second from bottom of the table, they probably could have done with a, a slightly easier Sunday evening. They had leaders Paris Saint-Germain to contend with. Callum Brown, watch this one. Kouami, give it away. Ruiz finds Vitinha. Well, that took a deflection. Kylian Mbappe's there, though. And Kylian Mbappe does what he does best. It's taken just eight minutes. Paris Saint-Germain have the lead. Bit of fortune about it. Fabian Ruiz finding Vitinha. His cross taking a wicked deflection onto the crossbar. Twa, nil. Paris Saint-Germain won. Kylian Mbappe's early strike. The difference. Verratti looking to change that. Great ball. Vitinha makes it two. And that. You have to imagine his game over. He's a little bit fortunate again. Vitinha, his head up, comes straight back to him after he was denied by Gallon from close range. Aldi for Lopez Yadi. His delivery, not a bad one at all. Xavier Chevalerant gets Twa back into this, maybe. Yadi with instant impact from the bench, a great delivery. Don Haruma came for it. Got nowhere near it. Chevalier ran in at the front post. Sanchez for Mbappe. Great stop from Gallo. No stopping that though. Fabian Ruiz seals a third for Paris Saint Germain. Helpless with the first. He made a great stop to deny Vitinha for the second. He followed up with a rebound. A brilliant stop to deny Mbappe there. But there's nothing he could have done about that from Fabian Ruiz. So Killian putting PSG en route to a win that takes them, as we mentioned, six points clear. A header as well. A fifth header in his uh, 207 PSG goals. It's an important goal for Mbappe as well on the individual basis because he's now on 25 for the season. That puts him one ahead of Alexandre Lacazette, um, who got that four-goal hole earlier in the day, of course. Uh, Toi winless in 17 now. They're likely to be relegated at uh, home against, uh, sorry, at Rennes next weekend, as we mentioned about Ajaxia. But back at the top of the table, PSG now six points clear, four games to go. JJ, that was a that was a big one yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they absolutely needed it after the week that they'd had. Um, I mean, it was it's strange because it's in keeping with some of the points that they picked up recently. I wouldn't say that they were particularly impressive in the way that they scored the goals. But then when you sort of look into the numbers, uh, I think it was some of the highest XG uh, that's been recorded as at least this season uh, in terms of league on games. But, you know, Mbappe, I mean, you mentioned that it was a headed goal. As fortunate as they come, given that, you know, the crossbar took the trois keeper out of it and then you just had to to nod it in. Um, and yeah, I mean, if to be honest, it really feels like PSG were doing everything that they possibly could to throw away that lead that they'd worked up for themselves after winning away <laughs> at Nice and, and winning at home to Lens. 
But, you know, I think getting the points there now, um, you know, seeing Marseille knocked out of second place by Lens as well, it's difficult to imagine Lens overtaking PSG between now and the end of the season. So I think that result and maybe one or two others, and especially given that PSG's running is fairly favourable, will probably be enough to get them over the line. But it's just kind of in keeping with this kind of underwhelming feeling, uh, you know, that, that PSG are going to get this historic 11th league on title over the line, yet immediately, uh, you know, it's going to lurch into sort of full PSG crisis mode where there are sweeping changes across the board. So you mentioned the week that they've had, JJ, uh, losing to Lorient, Lionel Messi heading off to Saudi Arabia on a, on a promotional tour, gets pictured with the, the falcon on his hand, as, uh, as, as we all have. I'm sure Andres has got one on his mantelpiece as we speak. He gets suspended by the club because he didn't have permission. And then on Wednesday, a, a group of Paris Saint-Germain fans stage a, a rather vociferous protest outside the, the administrative offices, the headquarters of, of, Paris, of, of Paris Saint-Germain, not far from the, the Parc des Princes. And then they go and win, but again, not particularly convincingly, this weekend. I mean, Andreas, you, you, like JJ, follow PSG closely. Messi suspended for two weeks. Why? Well, the, What's going on? Just the background is that the, the idea was that it was a day off for Paris uh, after that Lorient game, unless they lost. Of course, no one thought that they were going to lose, or I think unless they didn't win. So Messi just presumed, well, of course, we're going to beat Lorient. So he plans this trip to Saudi Arabia where Ian, he had to take some very, very important uh, holiday snaps uh, with him and Falcons in, in various parts of Saudi Arabia. Of course, they, of course, he took the photos. It wasn't a, it wasn't a professional photographer or anything like that. So he, he was sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's like I've promised uh a very important sponsor that I was, i'm going to be in saudi arabia and my actual employer wants me to be here he took the uh decision to go to saudi arabia maybe hoping that i don't know no one would notice uh but of course then the sort of world world fell in on 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 the, the whole situation and there were protests outside the uh, head office in in bien which is uh, as you say close to the uh, the part de Prince, uh, and then it had this sort of snowball effect. All the frustration uh, that Jonathan was kind of alluding to um, came to a head when a bunch of players went to uh, Neymar's house. I mean, Neymar hasn't even played for what two, three months, so maybe kind of a bit of sympathy for him. It's just the general frustration that these players are not quite, you know, sweating for the shirt, as the French would say. It, it, it's a bit curious because the, the, the Lionel Messi that arrived a couple of years ago, I mean, we remember the, the scenes when he came to Paris. It was delirium. It was like VE Day in 1998 and New Year's, New Year's Eve wrapped into one. I mean, you know, he was worshipped when Messi came. He's still the same player now as he was then. I mean, the same man, let's say. Maybe he's not, maybe quite the same level, but essentially he is. Um, he made the decision and, and it kind of just encapsulates what's going wrong at PSG. Um, he suspended two weeks. The question is now, will we see him again in a PSG shirt? Because, you know, matches are running out. And if he does play again, especially at the Parc de Prince, you know, look out for that, that, that atmosphere. There's a couple of important away games. Maybe he'll play those at Strasbourg and, and Auxerre. But uh, one thing's for sure is this is, this is his last season now, because there's no way that the situation can be fixed between Messi and, uh, and PSG. I mean, I think it was quite short-sighted as well of, of Messi's people. I mean, we know, we've known for a few weeks that there's these rumours as well of a massive offer from Saudi Arabia for Messi's services once his contract expires with PSG. You know, it, I think it was obvious that this was always going to sort of ignite into some controversy, uh, you know, and sort of Messi's video apology with his tail between his legs certainly has shades of uh, Thiago Silva's agent years ago, Marco Verratti as well, after a failed move to, to Barcelona. But I think one thing that actually has kind of been refreshing in all of this madness is that ever since I've sort of followed PSG since the early 2000s, PSG has always been a dramatic club. And a lot of people sort of say, sort of, what is PSG's identity these days? And I guess what we could say, sort of putting a 
trying to put a positive spin on what's quite been quite a negative cut last couple of years for PSG is that they are still who they've always been, which is this, you know, massively dramatic club where you get some of the most unique stories in football. Like only, only in Paris, only at PSG could Lionel Messi, the best player in modern footballing history, perhaps football history full stop, you know, be fined, suspended and barred from using all club facilities. I mean, it just, it, you know, it defies belief to say that this kind of, this, this is happening in Ligue 1. But when you sort of bear in mind PSG's history overall, it's very much in keeping with sort of how PSG have always been this, uh, you know, massive kind of soap opera of a club, even even way before uh, the arrival of Qatari ownership. I was just yeah. thinking about the use of the use of, the use of club facilities, uh, JJ. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I myself had to avail myself of the club facilities the other day when I arrived at the the, the, the same offices that, that we share at B in Sport um with 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 PSG. I didn't see Lionel Messi in there and I and I, I shan't <laughs> expect to. And if I do I shall I shall alert and and no Vladimir Schmitzer was 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 not I can confirm exclusively he was not in there. Also um there there was a there was a question of a massive offer from Saudi Arabia. I assume that was for playing football, Andres, and not for his falconry uh, <laughs> qualities. But well, apparently, yeah, falconry is like the number one sport in, in Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean that, that it is genuinely a, a big sport, and it's televised. And I know people have actually worked on TV production on falconry, but that's for another podcast. Um, look, where Messi goes next, it seems that there are three options: Barcelona being the least likely, some interest from from into Miami, I think. But it's a question of of fine. And no one is going to match um, Saudi's finances. And, and yeah, I think Jonathan's right. There is something unique about Paris. It's a, a big city. It's the biggest city in Europe with just the one club. It's obviously quite a glamorous city. And, and now money's come into it. Do players go to PSG for the, the right reason? Um, and Messi just crystallizes all that, doesn't he? Uh, but the question is, where did they move on from that? It, him leaving does free up quite a big uh, part of their wage bill. And the big question now for PSG, are they serious about this? Remember a while ago, uh, it, they stated that it's the end of the era of, you know, bling, bling and just throwing money at the big stars and so on. They do need to throw money at players, but it's got to be the right players. We've talked about this on, on the podcast so often. They have to, you, and it's, I don't like the word, Jonathan uses it, but he's right. The, the identity of team, what do they want to build? What kind of team? Uh, what, what how do they want to play just at the basics? What formation do they want to use? Again, last night, without going back too much to the match against Troyes, who incidentally were very poor, um, they went back to a 3-5-2, but that was because their first two two right backs were injured. That They're kind of forced into it. Worked okay. I mean, Warren Zaire Emery, fantastic player, 17, playing a sort of right wing back. Ekatike up front, but it was just because circumstances, you know, it's not part of a, I don't know if Jonathan agrees. It's not part of a master plan, is it? To have Ekatike and and Bappe as a front two. It's just they were forced into it. Ekatike, you know, great, great prospect, and it hasn't really worked out from a PSG. But if we don't use the word identity, at least have a plan for how you want to play football on the pitch, and pick the players that will fit into that plan. That that's that seems to be what they need to do this summer. Yeah, absolutely, and I think as well, uh, you know, sort of Galtier is doing as best he can to sort of cobble a team together. I mean, okay, you know, limited sympathy given, uh, you know, sort of the the depth and quality and talent that he has available to him in the squad, despite a few uh, inconvenient absences in certain positions. But th- there is this feeling now that, that PSG needs sort of greater vision moving forward. We know that Luis Campos has kind of wrestled with a lot since coming in because PSG had to spend big to keep Kylian Mbappe, which kind of hamstrung what they could do on the transfer window last summer. It'll be interesting to see how they move this summer. There's already a lot of big names, speculation, you know, names like Jose Mourinho thrown out there. I guess we'll only find out what direction PSG are going to head in, uh, you know, once we get to the end of the season, once that, you know, 11th title does get across the line. But, you know, it feels like, you know, based on sort of what we've seen this last couple of weeks, yes, I mean, it would be great to see more French talent, uh, you know, a more talent hailing from the, the Paris area included in PSG's first team plans. But more than anything, there needs to be some authority. There needs to be some discipline and not just necessarily from the coach, 
but from you know the the hierarchy as a whole you know Luis Campos we've seen him visibly seen him wrestling with that uh in recent months you know Lille at home Monaco away and you know this is something that really now needs to be taken in hand more more so than ever before I think because at the at the end of the day you know if this whatever change comes next for PSG if it fails you know the fans you know, based on sort of what we've seen and heard from them over the last cu- couple of months, will turn away and probably turn away from for good from this uh, Qatari project. That that is the danger, and and I think one of the big worries is the age of the players. That sometimes you get these quite interesting graphs that football analysts put together of the age of of a team, and superimposed on that is their kind of peak age for a player. Um, so, an example: people like Verratti, people like Marquinhos. Fantastic players, but you know they have gone over that peak age for players in that position. And if you look through the team, there's actually quite a lot in that situation. Yeah, there's there's very. If you look at the first eleven, there's very few who you're thinking they're coming to their peak in two or three years. And if we put Mbappe to one side, it it really does need quite a lot of work. That team, you know, if you look at PSG in three four years. I, th- I mean, there's some great younger players coming through. Nuno Mendes, I really like a lot. For instance, um, we talked about Zaire Emery, but they do need to bring in a fair number of players who are going to be hitting their peak in a few years, I think. I just like that. I just the two things stood out there, cobbling together and over their peak. It just reminds it reminds uh, <laughs> reminds me of us trying to, uh, to to get 10 players for a five a side. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> but more slight, only slightly more seriously, it has taken it has taken the the eyes off uh, the Mbappe question, the whole messy the whole messy affair. Because let's not forget, we're still we're still looking at Kylian Mbappe potentially having what twelve months left on his uh, twelve months left on his, his his PSG deal. It's the moment to cash in on, on Mbappe as well, but but surely not. This is this is an absolute massive moment in 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 Paris Saint Germain history. Mm. Uh, as, as, as a football club in terms of, of where they want to go. Talking about the 11th title, though, I mean, the fixture the fixture gods could not have been, uh, and goddesses who could not have been more kind. The last six games of the season, seven games of the season, Angers away, Lorient at home. Okay, we, they lost. Trois away, and then they've got Ajaxio at home, Auxerre away, Strasbourg away, Clermont home. Uh, if they don't get that 11th title across the line, JJ, um... The, the, the summer policy is going to be the last thing. It's going to be the last thing that they, they'll be worrying about. You're listening to uh, Andres Evagora, Jonathan Johnson, and me, Ian Holyman, on Le Bourgeois, the official Ligue 1 Uber Eats podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Ligue 1 underscore ENG. That's Ligue 1 underscore ENG. Sorry, sorry for the French. And of course, you can like, subscribe, follow, and recommend us on all the official podcast platforms. Now it's time for our Deja Who segment, of course, every month, a Ligue 1 Uber Eats shirt up for grabs. All you've got to do, and I say it all, is you've got to get who this player is, what makes them a, a little bit special, and what's their connection to all the other players who serve as answers throughout the month. You can email us your answers at league1podcast at gmail.com. And then if you get them all right, you stand a chance of winning that shirt. So who am I? After international success at youth level, I left home for the lures of Ligue 1 as a teenager. In total, I spent the next 16 years playing for nine different European clubs, including six in France, winning the Ligue 1 title, the Coupe de France and the Coupe de la Ligue, each with a different club. I also won Olympic gold, scored at a World Cup, and twice finished third in continental competition. Who am I, and against whom did I score at the World Cup? If you think you know who it is, send your answers via email to league1podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Best of luck with that one. Well, just one more thing to wrap up this week's action. It's to look forward to next week's action, round 35 Four matches to go in what has been a gripping Ligue 1 Uber Eats season so far. It's time for us to look ahead and take a little bon voyage. J, 
Gentlemen, round 35. Uh, uh, let's pick out a, a few of the highlights. Loss against Ras. Tricky one for uh, Frank Ezer's side. Paris Saint-Germain against the Jaxio. Surely a home banker. Brest against Auxerre, relegation six-pointer. Toulouse against Nantes. So it seems like we've had that one fairly recently. And Toulouse five, Nantes one in the uh, Coupe de France final. Monaco against Lille, fourth against fifth. Marseille at home to Angers. Plenty to go at next week. JJ, where do you fancy? That's a good question. I mean, there's, uh, you know, I'm kind of spoiled for choice with a lot of those. I'm going to try and go outside of the box. I'm very tempted by Lance France, but I'm looking at that Clermont game against Lyon. Now, we were talking about Lyon's chances of getting into Europe, and Clermont have been really unexpectedly good and consistent this season. And there is a massive danger if Lyon don't pick up maximum points that they won't get into Europe. I think that that one could be quite an underrated game. I'm not quite expecting the same goal fest that we saw against Montpellier, but for me, I think that one could be quite an underrated game because it's now going to be a massive sense of importance for Lyon to get the results in order to get themselves into Europe, especially with the ownership change. So for me, I think that's the one that I'd be tempted to tune into. That is outside the box, but you're quite right as well. Clermont came into this weekend's game against Orsay with five straight wins. Pascal Gastian, unbelievable job he's doing, he's doing there. A draw with Osea this weekend. Andres, what do you fancy? I always look out for Wren because of your love of sausages in Wren. But you know, the, <laughs> the bet for our for our listeners around the world, the best sausages in France actually come from Trois. And if you know, have you ever had Trois sausages? They are really delicious. But I'm not going to go for Wren Trois. I love a relegation scrap. So looking at those fixtures, it's got to be Brest against Osea. I think that is going to be really feisty. I think the winner of that game will be safe. Um, so I, I, I go for that. I think that, that's one really to look out for, Brest or Sal. Yeah, I think for me, Lens Reims is the, the obvious standout, standout fixture. But uh, Marseille against Angers at home. Interesting. Marseille, Marseille not the best at home. It has to, it has to be said. Angers already relegated, playing with, uh, playing with the, the breaks off. No, no, no pressure on them whatsoever. Huge pressure on Marseille. And imagine if Angers get the first goal at the Velodrome on Sunday. And of course, they will know how Lens have done earlier in the weekend. So if, if Lens win at home to Reims, which is, which is not a given, which is not a given. Lens, though, with 15 home wins this season, the best, the best record in, in, in Europe's top five leagues. But if Lens win, massive pressure on Marseille. On Sunday, even even though it's up against a, a team that's already relegated, so I think I'll go to the velodrome, sit very very safely in the press stand, and just sit back and and watch the fireworks almost literally as as that one goes off. Well, that wraps up things for this weekend. Don't forget you can head to the official English website of Ligue 1 Uber Eats, League One Uber Eats League All the match reports, all the video highlights right there for you of this weekend's actions and we'll have previews and features looking ahead to next weekend's action as well for you a little bit later in the week any questions just get in touch with us of course and those quiz answers for deja who league one podcast at gmail.com and please do like subscribe follow and recommend us on all the usual podcast channels so we'll be back next week with a roundup of all the round 35 actions its implications European qualification, narrow escapes, and of course, relegation for clubs going down this season. Remember, as Ligue 1 is getting trimmed for 18 next season. There'll be another uh, Deja Who quiz, of course, with our next May mystery man and that Ligue 1 Uber Eats jersey up for grabs. All that's left now is for me to thank Andreas Evagora and Jonathan Johnson for their time and insight. And from me, Ian Holyman, it's goodbye and we'll see you again next week. Oh my word, what a goal! Gotta be! Lovely finish! Oh yes, delivery, getting Duzzi's header! Here's an opportunity, Sanchez! Outrageous goal from Gael Kakuta! Play it again! And Goldberg! Messi again, this time maybe Messi's done it!